Uh, hi everyone, my name is Milaj Rahedorang. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Nevada Reno. I'm going to present you the shake table tests on shallow foundation liquefied soil support on helical piles. Uh, Pro uh, Professor Motemed is not able to be in here. He is in a sabbatical in the University of Tokyo. I'm going to present uh, this work. This uh, experiment uh, conducted in collaboration with the uh, uh, graduate students and also the Professor El Gamal at UC San Diego and with the help of Atul Prayanko and Mohamed Zaid. Can you speak a little bit closer Here, to okay. First of all, I want to acknowledge Pierre for their support and funding this project. Uh, second, uh, the staff and the group of graduate students who helped me at UC San Diego to conduct my test. And uh, lastly, for the Ramjack, uh, they're going to help me to conduct my uh, helical pile test um, for our mitigation as a, our mitigation measure for liquefaction into settlement. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, the background and motivation of our tests. Uh, second, the experimental program and the test series number one, uh, which uh, we, we have no solution for the liquefaction induced settlement. Uh, it's a benchmark test. And uh, finally, the future testing program for the next year. Uh, as a field reconnaissance and observation based on the Tohoku earthquake on March 11, 2011, there is a widespread liquefaction and it caused 27,000 buildings damage in that area. Uh, the number of buildings damage is similar to what we see in Christchurch earthquake, uh, it, to 20,000 buildings damage in Christchurch earthquake and uh, uh, the, the, those are as a result of the widespread liquefaction occurred and, uh, in that site. The performance of the buildings uh, varied based on the foundation that they have. Uh, the buildings uh, which built on deep foundations uh, have good performance uh, and uh, they almost got zero settlement. But the uh, ones on shallow foundations uh, undergo uh, higher uh, settlement values. As you can see in the photo, uh, in the free field condition, we have 30 centimeters of settlement uh, after Tohoku earthquake uh, as the liquefaction do settlement. Uh, but the building uh, supported on piles uh, undergo no settlement uh, and the building on the mat foundation undergoes 70 centimeters of settlements which 2.3 times greater than our free field condition. Uh, based on uh, what we observe in the field and uh, what's done uh, to come up with the uh, approaches to uh, uh, mitigate the effects of liquefaction induced settlements uh, and also to come up with the mechanism which controls the settlements in settlement induced uh, liquefaction induced settlement. Uh, there are different approaches to go and research the uh, liquefaction induced settlements based on field case histories and centrifuge tests, mongy shake table tests and field tests. Uh, in 1964 Niigata earthquake, uh, Yoshimi and Tokimatsu come up with the data of the liquefaction in those settlements and they conducted a series of uh, 1G shake table tests to supplement their work and they come up with the uh, settlement curves uh, based on the foundation width and the uh, foundation, uh, the uh, thickness of liquefiable layer and uh, after that we have uh, centrifuge test conducted by Professor Dobry at uh, RPI and Professor Bray at Berkeley. They did uh, the centrifuge test to uh, come up with the liquefaction induced settlement mechanism. Professor Bray here uh, conducted the test and come up with the mechanism which controls the liquefaction induced settlements. And uh, finally, from uh, since 2015, uh, we at UNR are uh, doing some scale shake table tests to uh, examine the effects of liquefaction induced settlement and to come up with a solution to see how we can mitigate the effects of uh, this settlement. Uh, based on the number of uh, tests and cost per test and the scale of model, we have to decide uh, what kind of uh, shake table and what uh, the size of the box or size of the model are we are going to use. As we can see, uh, as the scale of the model increases, the cost per test of uh, the cost per test increase exponentially, and the number of tests decreases. 
based on the funding options that, uh, that we have, uh, we decided to do two tests, one without mitigation as a benchmark test and one uh, with mitigation with helical piles. I'm going to uh, talk about them in detail. Uh, before that, uh, I, I want to show some, kind of, uh, some of the shake table uh, setups uh, around the world. The first one is the E-Defense shake table at the uh, University of uh, at, uh, J Japan. The length of the uh, laminar box is uh, 16 meter and the height of the laminar box is 5 meter. It's a pretty huge box. Professor Motamed did some tests uh, uh, about the uh, liquefaction its effects uh, on this box. Uh, second is the UC San Diego laminar box, outdoor UC San Diego laminar box with the height of 4.7 meters and the length of 6.7 meters. The one that we conducted our first test is UCSD uh, uh, laminar box in Powell lab. Uh, the height of the box is 2.9 meter and the length is 3.9 meter and the the one we did our preliminary test before we go and do our experiment in uh, UC San Diego is uh, this box with the length of 2 meter and the uh, height of 0.8 meter. For this study, our testing program uh, is a set of uh, two series of tests, one with mitigation, one without mitigation. We conducted our first test, uh, our benchmark test, is completed on June 2018. Uh, there's no mitigation measures, but uh, for the next year, we're planning to do the test with the helical pods as a countermeasure to reduce the amount of settlements uh, in the free field conditions and below the foundations. Uh, for this test, uh, uh, three series of shakings conducted with different PGA values and different groundwater levels. Uh, uh, for the first test, we conduct uh, the p uh, we uh, did the shake with 4.15 g, uh, and the groundwater level is at 0.6 meter below the ground level. And for the second one, uh, we increase the PGA, and the the groundwater level is the same. And the for the last test, we uh, increase the groundwater level, and we set it on the ground surface. And uh, with the same PGA, we conducted our test. Uh, the shape of motion uh, that we use as our input motion is, uh, is this shape, uh, this kind of shape of motion. We have six seconds to warm up, the, and for the next six, seconds, next, next six seconds, we are going to have the uniform input motion of 0.15 PGA with frequency of two hertz. And the last six seconds uh, is the drift down of our motion. Uh, this is our target input motion that we put for the PGA.15 and different funds for 0.3 Gs as PGA. But the shape of motion is the same. We have the uniform motion with the frequency of 2 Hz. Uh, our uh, benchmark test, uh, uh, or our test series number one, we use an isolated footing. As you can see, uh, the distance from the longitudinal boundaries is 0.6 meters, and uh, from the lateral boundaries is 1.3 meters. We want to be sufficiently away from the boundaries. Uh, also, we have laminar box, and there is no effect of uh, the box and the rigidity of our box. Uh, and for our First two tests, we uh, set the groundwater level at 0.6 meter below the foundation. Uh, it means the, uh, our cross layer is uh, not saturated for our two tests. <coughs> we have three sets of layers. Uh, first, the dense layer sand, uh, one meter dense layer sand, uh, and we have uniform loose sand without any mitigation measures. Uh, it's 1.3 meter. F the thickness of this layer is 1.3 meter, and the thickness of cross layer is 0.6 meters, and uh, for the first two tests, uh, the cross layer is unsaturated, and the la for the last shaking, uh, the, uh, uh, we saturate the cross to see the effects of uh, saturated cross in settlements. Uh, and the contact pressure for our footing is 41.6 uh, kPa, uh, which uh, meant to reproduce a low store building foundation. We use an extensive um, instrumentation. I'm going to show the instrumentation in the next uh, slides. The laminar box that we use, uh, I stated earlier at UCSD Powell Lab, the, the length of the box is 3.9 meter, uh, the height of the box is 2.9 meter. They increase the height of the, extend the height of the box recently, and uh, previously the height of the box is 1.9 meter. The width of the box is 1.8 meter. 
Uh, as a model preparation, uh, we use the dumper to dump the soil and we uh, create our dense layer in, sub, uh, in three sub layers and we compact it with uh, the Vibro compactor uh, and we move the Vibro compactor in 20 passes to reach our relative density, desired relative density. Uh, the foundation used uh, as a spread footing uh, is 1.3 meter length, 0.6 meter width and 0.4 meter height. And we want to examine the settlement of the foundation. Uh, we embed the foundation on in cross layer and we put it on the cross layer. Then we uh, increase our the, the thickness of our cross layer for 0.4 for, for meters to come up with the level surface of our foundation and the, our cross layer. Uh, uh, because we want to reach the contact pressure of 40 kPa uh, that we produce a one-two story building, we use some superstructure base on our foundation to reach that value. And the uh, picture uh, before, prior to any shaking is, uh, is shown in the upper, uh, the, in the lower part of the slide. And uh, as the soil, uh, characterization of the soil we use that uh, we use the Ottawa F65 sand uh, as uh, our soil to build our model it's a pretty well characterized sand and uh, as I mentioned we construct our layers in three layers we have one shallow cross layer uh, from top to down uh, the thick loose layer and the dense layer uh, as model preparation for the dense layer, I, I stated before we use the uh, we create the our dense layer in three sub layers, and the, for our loose layer, uh, we dump the soil. Uh, the method is uh, water sediment, air pollution, and water sedimentation. We dump our soil uh, through two screens, one below the dumper, one above the water level. We want to create the loose layer. And for the shallow cross layer, we just use one set of a screen and uh, dump. Uh, it's a it's a dry deposition method uh, we use to come up with the shallow cross layer, and uh, we use the human weight to just uh, compact a little bit to create a medium dense layer. Uh, 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 for the measurement of relative density, we have uh, three methods. Uh, the methods used to come up with the relative density of each layer is sand cone test, uh, and we use the volume and weight of each layer to come up with the relative density. And finally, the DCP test used for the calculation of relative density. In this picture, you can see the, uh, uh, our friends doing the the uh, sand cone test and the second one is DCP test uh, for the calculation of relative density uh, and the values of uh, the relative density based on the test done uh, for our dense layer we come up with the values of 83 percent to 90 percent for our dense layer that are pretty close that we can use uh, each of the values for our dense layer because uh, they can uh, we can say that we have we reached our dense layer based on these values. But for the loose and cross layer, we can't do DCP test because as we want to do the DCP test, uh, the, the penetrometer goes through the uh, all layer and we can't calculate the relative density based on DCP test. Uh, and for the cross layer, based on the sand cone test and the weight and volume of our layer, we can come up to values 52 and 53 percent uh, that are uh, representing our medium dense layer. Uh, as our instrumentation plan, uh, you can see our instrumentation plan as a set of arrays uh, used uh, below the foundation and also in two sides, north and south sides of the foundation to uh, come up with the acceleration time histories for water pressure generations and also to record uh, what we have and we use a string, a string pots, linear pots, uh, and uh, to measure our displacements and also settlements in our test. The, the total number of the instrumentation used for this study is 144, and the number of accelerometers, high resolution accelerometers, pore water pressures, and string pots and linear pots are shown in the table. Uh, this uh, extensive amount of instrumentation used for this test to come up with the acceleration time histories uh, through the uh, thickness of soil layer and also poor water pressure generation in liquefiable soil and also in dense, dense sand soil. 
and the string parts used uh, for the linear deformation of the uh, absolute deformation of the box and also to measure the settlement of the foundation and the linear parts uh, are for the free field uh, measurement of the settlement and you can see some of the some type of instruments we use for this test string parts, linear parts and also accelerometers and pore water pressure for this test uh, in this video uh, we are going to uh, see the PGA 0.15 G uh, and the ground water level at 0.6 meter and the shaking you can see the string parts uh, which can uh, measure the absolute displacement of the laminates and so yeah Uh, we do three series of tests, it's just one of them. Three sequence of shaking is 0.15 G and we use, we do it for 0.3 G with the ground water level at 0.6 meter and also the saturated crust. Uh, uh, for the overall observations and conclusions for based on what we did on UC San Diego, uh, test series number one benchmark results are being processed and the liquefaction and sand ejecta were achieved uh, and we so far we have good agreement with published literature and the prior test we did at US UNR uh, and uh, we are going to use this benchmark test uh, as a prior blind prediction I guess uh, and uh, it's going to be announced in two months I guess uh, the values of our settlements and free field and the below the foundation details are going to be uh, announced later for the future work, uh, we are going to use some mitigation measures. Uh, we are going to use helical piles because they are cost effective and they, nowadays they are applicable to new constructions and existing also existing buildings. We did some uh, 1G shaking table tests on dry sands and we are going to do it on liquefied soil. The shape of helical piles we modeled uh, because our model is uh, pretty small than the what we use in UC San Diego. These are the scaled uh, helical piles we use for our dry sand. This setup was used for our uh, uh, dry sand test. We have accelerometers to measure the acceleration of each pile and the top weight uh, on each pile. And uh, we are going to do our test uh, with helical piles as a mitigation measure in liquefiable soil to see what happens. Uh, to the settlement values and the uh, final picture is the uh, instrumental telcal pile and uh, th thank you for your attention uh, and I'm really happy to answer your questions Yeah. It's not our typical problem, and, and so I don't understand how the soil is being modeled, uh, is being representative of a site, for example, I'm looking at in New Zealand right now, where the basement is several hundred meters, uh, the liquid bottle layer is a depth of 10 to 12 meters, uh, you've got long period vibrations, you've got all kinds of other things going on. This thing does not, I don't see how either people Sorry, I served a little defense with you. They have a hard time justifying the scale. So I don't see how you can, you can justify the scale here, except possibly to model, uh, to use the music to verify uh, constitutive models. But I think that are some doubts. Uh, yes, uh, uh, because Sorry, it's a. I don't, uh, you know, you're, you're probably the wrong person to be shooting here in front of everybody. But, uh, <laughs> another way of looking at it is there are cases. Shallow liquefaction can be very important, mm -hmm. Jelly, Turkey, and some places in Christchurch. And every model has some limitations and some insights. I agree that the bigger the model in 1G, the better it is. So they've got, I guess you're at 2.9 meters now. Yeah, 2.9 extended one meter. 5 meters is better, 10 meters is better. So what I'm saying is that the 8 meter box doesn't work because you cannot scale the structure just right. Because the scaling between the structure and the soil does not work. That's the problem, is that connection. 
But I mean, the Senate, which I love, you've done on the Senate, one of the problems I understand is just that we never get to put up agenda. In real case history, a significant agenda, but at least in these tests, the tests that I've seen that they've done, they've got some agenda. So you're doing something that provides an insight, and then there's limitations. I think you had that quote from EI. Yeah, yeah, I forgot to tell it, yeah. Yeah, there are those limitations. And the expense that you put, oh look, it's million dollars to fill the box that he defends and to empty, okay? For a million dollars, we can do a lot more, we can instrument size. So what I'm saying is that I, I see, you know, a lot of work going in here, but the fact is that being your site, nobody's going to argue about the cost of improvement. It's the, it's the 10, 12, 20 meter sites that are becoming a problematic because they're the depth very large expense. Okay. Yes. So three meters side on rock. I'm not even going to bother with it. I'm just going to say, you know, jump on it and it's going to be intensified. Just to be clear, Pierre is not paying million dollars for this. <laughs> 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 We're funding a very small portion of it. So. <laughs> 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 yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know, maybe we can see what's the result of process, what value is coming out of these. Mm. Uh, that's mentioned in one G-shake table test. Uh, we can't come up with the overburden pressure or the real model. Maybe the centrifuge test has better results. But uh, in our test, we can reproduce one of the settlement in uh, liquefaction induced settlement mechanism, which is sand ejecta. We can see proper sand ejecta in our test. Uh, that, that, that's, the, that's the point. And we can just reproduce the amount of settlement which can cause by the sand ejecta.